As we can see, I'm not exactly gifted when it comes to the, the hair department. That's because my hair follicles on the top of my head have stopped producing hair. The hair follicle is actually a type of organ that our bodies have. Some people might call it a mini organ. It has specialized tissues or cell types, like the hair papilla that helps to control hair growth. There's also the root sheath that surrounds and protects growing hair. There's the bulge region, which acts as a reservoir for hair follicle stem cells. You also have the associated sebaceous gland, which secretes oils to help your skin to stay healthy. Another cell type that's associated with the hair follicle is called the melanocyte. Melanocytes are specialized cells that produce pigments called melanins. On one hand, you have a dark pigment called eumelanin, and on the other hand, you have a reddish pigment called pheomelanin. Interestingly, the cellular processes that produce our hair color, or even our skin color, those are the same processes that produce fur color in mice. In this video, we're gonna take a look at a transmembrane protein called the melanocortin-1 receptor. We'll explore how this protein is involved in pigment synthesis in the melanocytes of the field mouse, Perimiscus polyanotis. The MC1R protein is a product of the MC1R gene. It's comprised of a chain of amino acids that is 317 units long. Remember, DNA is transcribed into mRNA, and that mRNA is then translated by a ribosome into a chain of amino acids, which itself is the protein, right? That's what proteins are. They're long chains of amino acids. After the MC1R gene is transcribed and then translated into a protein, that protein moves to the cell membrane, where it takes up residence as a transmembrane protein. Transmembrane protein, um, this means that part of the protein extends outwardly from the cell, and another part of the protein sort of points inwardly into the cell. The protein literally spans across the membrane. These types of proteins can be used for all kinds of functions. Some proteins, like the MC1R, they're used to detect something going on outside of the cell, and they then transmit a signal to the inside of the cell. Transmembrane proteins are how cells can react to their surroundings. So this MC1R protein is extending out from the cell into what we call the extracellular space. If the MC1R protein happens to come into contact with a hormone called the melanocyte stimulating hormone, or MSH, it'll make a connection. The melanocortin-1 receptor and the melanocyte-stimulating hormone, they'll temporarily kind of bind to each other. When that happens, when that connection is made, it causes the melanocyte-1 receptor to change shape in a certain way, simply due to that connection or the bonds that it has formed with that hormone molecule. Because of its new shape, the MC1R protein can now more readily interact with certain molecules that are floating past it on the inside of the cell. When it interacts with the molecules on the inside of the cell, it literally kickstarts a whole cascade of reactions inside the cell that switch on a series of other genes that ultimately produce proteins that manufacture the dark pigment that ends up on the inside of the hairs of mouse fur. So, MC1R and MSH bind to each other. MC1R changes shape, in a very specific way, and that sets off reactions within the cell, and it's those reactions that cause a series of other genes to be turned on, and those genes make proteins that make pigments. Now, if for some reason, the MC1R protein itself wasn't quite manufactured right, it might still bind to that stimulating hormone, but it might not change shape in just the right way, and it might not be able to kickstart that series of biochemical reactions within the cell that are responsible for producing the pigment. Of course, there are other ways that the whole pathway can get kickstarted, but the MC1R protein is one really great and reliable way to do it. Let's take a quick detour. What does it mean to switch on a gene? Well, when a gene is switched on, 
That simply means that the gene is being transcribed into mRNA, and then that mRNA gets translated into the associated protein. Mice have 20 some thousand genes, and this is important. Not all 20,000 genes are being used in every cell type all the time. The genes that produce the proteins that manufacture the pigment eumelanin, they're not being transcribed and translated in every body part and organ within the mouse. And this is true of a lot of genes. It would be a waste of cellular resources to manufacture proteins that aren't used for the functioning of a particular cell type. For example, the cells in mouse hair follicles and the cells that make up mouse kidneys have exactly the same DNA. But those cells produce very different sets of proteins because of which genes are being transcribed and then translated in those tissue types. Hair follicles produce hair. Kidneys sort of filter blood and waste products and ultimately produce urine. It'd be a complete misuse of cellular resources, not to mention a little strange, if mouse kidneys grew hair and yeah, it'd be pretty awkward if mouse hair follicles produced urine. Let's get back to the story. If you watched the genetics video in this series, you'll know that we've been examining two specific alleles of the MC1R gene. The first allele, we give it the designation R. That simply signifies that it's the R genine variant of the gene. The second allele, we'd give it the designation C, and that signifies that it's the cysteine variant of the gene. If you haven't seen the genetics video yet, go check it out. These two different alleles produce two slightly different versions of the MC1R protein. The R allele of the MC1R gene produces a version of the MC1R protein that's really good at setting off those reactions within the cell after it binds to the stimulating hormone. With the R allele, there's lots of pigment production in Perimiscus polyonotus mice, and they end up with really dark fur. The C allele, well, the protein that it produces doesn't set off those same reactions in the cell after it binds to the melanocyte stimulating hormone. The result, well, mice with the C allele tend to have lighter fur colors. Now, what if a mouse is heterozygous? Let's say that it has an R allele and a C allele. What then? Will it be dark? Will it be light? Well, to answer this, we just need to think about what the proteins do. The mouse's melanocyte cells, in this case, will produce some of those kick-ass, high-functioning MC1R proteins that are great at setting off reactions within the cell, and they'll produce some of those MC1R proteins that aren't so good at setting off cellular reactions. These cells might therefore produce an intermediate amount of the eumelanin pigment, not all the way dark and not all the way light. To learn more about the MC1R protein and how it helps to produce the pigment eumelanin, or to explore a different aspect of this case, be sure to check out the mouse fur color content on our EvoEd website, or you can follow the links down below in the description. Thanks for tuning in. I'll see you next time.